Here. Yep. I hope the best, the best. So Ben, you yeah. and Piper, once again, thanks for joining me. It's a fine evening for me and early afternoon for you. Yeah. Quarter after two, actually. Is it seven? I guess. Yeah, quarter past seven here. Yeah. 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 And um, you said you've just finished work. Is that you finished for the Christmas period now? Uh, no, I usually I'm I'm gonna keep on working after I uh, I don't really have like I I usually work eight to four, but I, it's pretty flexible and I can I usually end up being on my on my work phone before that time and after that time. So right, and it goes into flexi time though. You you get those hours um well i'm i yeah my my manager and i have a, a, a good uh agreement off the record kind of thing it's it's the new reality with COVID, right we work from like we telework so we work from home and uh, some of us have to balance between family and work and especially now that we're back in lockdown uh a lot of and it's Christmas time so a lot of people have their children at home so in order to balance between that and work um, I mean we're all adults and responsible and I, I manage a team as well so okay. I mean I'm the one that's going to suffer if I don't do my time right yeah. so yeah um, fair enough. I'm gonna have to catch up after and then the next day is going to be hard so I usually stick to my eight to four and you know if I if I have to do something during the day for the kids or whatnot, then I'll put it back. How many kids? Right. Do you have lots of kids? I have three. Three children already. <laughs> you have lots of kids. How many do you know of? <laughs> Not to know, you know. <laughs> no, I I uh, I have three boys, and I've been with my wife for eighteen years actually. There you go. There you go. It must be a lot must of be a lot of work. So we we met, and then I think two or three months after she got pregnant, and so we had our first one, and been together ever since. That's good. That's good. It was meant to be. It was. It was. <laughs> I can hear. I can hear my your 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 mic. Your mic. It's coming. It's coming. I suppose there's not there's not one until that. Um. So, like, so, like, so what age is, what age is the Christmas still special? What's that? It's Christmas, it's Christmas special for the children. For the children. Christmas special for the children. Yeah, it, it, it's well. No, it's different, right? Because we we're gonna do it like at home. We're not going anywhere. We're not having people over mm -hmm. here. So, but it doesn't change, right? Christmas is Christmas, and they'll get their gifts. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So, and it's, it's kind of nice, actually. I, I, I'm not one to like, I know a lot of people or I should say people, um, take it differently, you know, uh, COVID and the, the whole pandemic and the, the lockdown and everything. I, I know the seriousness of it and I, I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's that personally, I, I took the best of it, I should say, like, um, it, it helped me to, I guess, slow down the, the really fast pace that we live in. Mm -hmm. And uh, it allowed me to um, reflect on that a little bit and realize that some of the things that were taking space in my head and taking space, like in terms of time and sometimes wasn't necessarily important enough for me to, to, to use that time towards these things. So I, it, it's kind of a, a reset and and ground myself on what's important and um, where I need to to put my attention and where to focus that really matters to me and the ones around me. Yeah, I think that was good for that. And also, I think the com my wife and I always had a good communication, but I think it it's now up to an, a whole other level where we communicate a lot and. Um, she was going through some stuff before COVID and during COVID. So all these things adding up, I, I, I take it as a, you know, a, a life lesson. There's, there's always something to learn from. And yeah, I think you learn the most out of difficult situation and I guess 
COVID is just another thing that I, I, I'm learning from. And so, and also kind of odd for me to be on YouTube and say that I'm more of an introvert and don't like cameras and stuff like that. But it, it's, um, I guess it's something where we would have touched on later uh, as to why I'm making videos. It was sort of to, to cope with the fact that I'm an introvert and I, I'm not necessarily the most social person, although like I, I like to talk to people and stuff and crack jokes. I'm a pretty funny guy, but I'm, I'm comfortable in my little, I'm like a hermit. <laughs> I'm comfortable in my little bubble and, and smoke my pipe and do my things. And so COVID was just, all right, I'm in my bubble now. Like I, I yeah. can do my stuff. So I found myself being more productive okay. at work without necessarily be uh, working, without necessarily working more, but the, the hours that I put in are more productive because I'm not distracted by all these things around me at work and mm. get caught up like talking to this person and this person yeah. and so. Well, that's true. Uh, well, that's true. Business is business both. Is both. Is both. The workforce yeah. and things get done and yeah. uh, in general work smarter not harder using tech tools and you know like he had a group of people in an office trying to come to some sort of an agreement on a meeting and the agenda but then everyone's working at home and everyone through teams and microsoft or whatever has the agenda yeah. being written right in front of their face so it's yeah. hard to it's hard to for anything to be misconstrued so i know what you mean by that yeah. things get done better and you work smarter but that's good as well you're, you're able to have that perspective and uh, how COVID is for your personal elite type anyway quite easy to to uh, hold fast as it yeah is. yeah that's yeah. good and um, what are you smoking today then um for a burly i'm just finishing oh, up yes. a jar i know I'm, you like burly. yeah you i too. know you like burly as well eh? yeah i'm not tonight though what am i on this is a. Uh, my mixture 965 and then I've got a, a McBarn classic amber sitting there ready. I think there's a little burly in it, but not nothing too serious. But I need to try more burly blends. Um, well, I wasn't into I wasn't really into burly before, mostly because of the, the nicotine content that people were talking about. Um, and I haven't smoked the pipe for you know 20 years, so I. Um, first started like a lot of people uh by mistake smoking aromatics and uh quickly or perhaps not so quickly but after a couple of months i started to step away or venture into other tobacco types um blend types mm -hmm. and uh i think the first non-aromatics were um frog morton regular the the uh, Mc mcclellan Frog Morton, the the regular one on a log, I think it's called, or yeah, um, and um, Orlick Golden Slice was my first experience with Virginias, and then I really got the kick of like trying more natural tobaccos, and uh, recently I think in the last year or so tried blends that have burley and found myself really liking, um, not particularly uh, straight burley. Uh, but blends that have burley, I really uh, found myself liking Virginia burleys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think they complement each other very well, and a uh, few mixtures that I have of Virginia burley, and I I just really really like them. Mm -hmm. I find they're really easy, easy, <clears throat> very easy to smoke, and just sometimes not the most flavorful and complex mixture, but something that I found myself reaching for more and more. Um, see if that that burly pouch that I had, I opened uh, about a month ago, and uh, I have a bunch of jars open, and that's that one just disappeared because I found myself reaching for that. Um, it's just a a good all day, you know. I. I it's good with coffee. It's good with whatever. And sometimes it's just, uh, you don't feel like having, you know, something that has a, a casing or a particular flavor or this one's just an easy, it, it's, it, it really took me by, by, by surprise, really. 
Yeah. Hey, I was hey, like I was like that one before original yeah. original the dog. Yeah. Did you mix some of your uh, caramel tobacco at the bottom? No. No, I haven't tried that yet. Uh, I was going to do that with the old dark fire just to. Sometimes old dark fire uh, gets a bit acrid for me in the second half, but the last smoke of it that I had was different. I must have packed it just perfectly or something. It was fine. Um, well, that's what I, I agree with you on that. Um, the straight burly is, uh, is not during the smoke that I have an issue. It is more towards the end, like the last third or the last second half of the bowl really starts to be more acrid metallic kind of, and then it gets harsh yeah. near like the bottom near the end. Yeah. Um, and I've heard someone, someone on a, on a podcast before, um, I don't know if you know uh, Pipe Stud. It's a website in the U.S. that sells uh, yeah and tins, and uh, he was saying that he uh, he he puts something at the bottom of a bowl, and then he uses like a Five Brother, which is a Burley, yeah. uh, or or uh, Dunhill. He's he's really big into one of the Dunhill one and. Uh, he uses some tobacco for the bottom of the bowl and then loads up something else on the on top. Mm -hmm. And when he gets to that bottom tobacco, he it, it's just for a, yeah, it's just to to give some sort of a flavor and a, a bit of that flavor. But he doesn't necessarily smoke it, so he smokes the burly. And when he gets to the the other tobacco he put at the bottom, he stops smoking it. I, yeah, fair enough. So I think we're not the only ones. Mm. <laughs> I've heard people talk about it a lot with uh, the the Solani aged barley flake as well, like the metallic halfway through. That's hard to avoid sometimes, but it depends what mood you're into, or what way you've packed the bowl, and what you've just eaten. There's a whole load of factors, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so unicorn piper, how'd you come across that name? Is it just because oh, the unicorns are rare? And <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a, a a joke, I guess, that started that uh, with a uh, a friend, a girl, a coworker, mm -hmm. uh, a lady I work with, and then um, her and and the, her friend. I don't know. There, there was something, and then they 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 made a comment. I think it was a. I don't even know the whole story behind it, but because I'm sort of a one of a kind and um, how I am with my wife and the boys and stuff, they were like, you know, saying that I was one of a kind. And then one day she said, oh, my friend always calls you the unicorn. And then it's, it sort of stays. And then when I had, when I started the channel, um, I was talking to that colleague of mine then was saying, oh, I, I'm thinking, you know, there's that YouTube community uh, of pipe smoking and then people make videos and stuff and then I, I've been following for a while but it's my, my channel name is my name and I don't want to start making videos using my name mm -hmm. and uh, I tried a couple different ones and they were all taken or YouTube wouldn't let me uh, choose that name so I was like I don't know what to what to you know call the channel and she said once you call it unicorn I'm like wait a minute unicorn piper so that's plain and simple that's how it started there was no big Actually, meaning behind it or whatever it was just a, con a lunch conversation at work and that name came up and that's how i yeah i uh i changed the, the channel name that evening and then started making videos soon after that it's a great name fantastic name yeah. certainly memorable anyway <laughs> And so was your first language French then? Yeah, I was uh, born and raised in uh, Canada near Ottawa mm -hmm. on the Quebec side. And it's a French province. So uh, school in French, my parents are French and only started speaking English when I was um, 18 or 19. Like we learned the basics in school, but 
there's always that barrier of like being shy and stuff and you don't want to like, and, and you don't know necessarily any, you don't have any friends that are Anglophone. And so, um, but when I started working at the, uh, the nightclub, the pub nightclub, there's more people cause the, the, the legal age is not the same drinking age. What is so, it? Uh, on our side is 18 and across the river, across the bridge is 19. So a lot of, Ontario um, people would come to the Quebec side to uh, hang out in the pubs and clubs. And uh, so that's, you have a lot of uh, mixed culture and people from the uh, more Anglophone side. So I have to start, that's where I, I develop more of my um, being bilingual. Yeah, okay. And then I met my wife and she's from Toronto. So what age were you when you met her then? 18, 19? Were you uh, I was, I was uh, around 20. Mm -hmm. yeah, 21, to be exact. There you go. True love. True love. Yeah. Yeah. How long before you were married? Not married still. Oh, really? Yeah. We're living in sin. <laughs> <laughs> According to some people, yeah. Yeah 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 i wouldn't listen to anyone who, who thinks that yeah no i i was never really into getting married or anything if i when i met my we talked about it many times and i i sort of do things like differently or my own way sometimes and i guess for the fact that my my parents got divorced i always said that if i was going to get married it was going to be after having kids so that they see us uh getting married and being in love rather than you know getting divorced because that's a lot of that's what a lot of kids are going through seeing seeing their parents getting divorced and arguing yeah and i said if ever i i get married i want the opposite is where my kids would see us being happy and getting married rather than divorcing so yep if, that's perfect yep. yeah i don't know if it's ever gonna happen but at least they're old enough now to to witness that they, they see us that like they they know we're we're even though we've been together 18 years and we're like almost 40 years old we're acting as silly as if we were 18 and just fell in love yesterday so that's it's kind of cool that's yeah. really good it's really good to hear that Really good. Now, what's your wife's name? Just out of interest, then. Therese. Therese, Irish. Yeah. Um, she's actually it's it's uh she actually has a Hungarian name. Her dad is Hungarian, but the mom is Fil the mom was Filipina, mm. so she has the Asian look. She looks really Asian, but um, yeah, she has uh. A mixed background, 50-50 Hungarian and uh, Filipino. Cool. Interesting. Mm -hmm. We would have a name that's spelt the same way. We would pronounce it Therese. Yeah, that's how we say it in French. Oh, Therese. Then. And then has she decided to learn French or have you been schooling her on her? Uh, actually, it's, it's interesting because the dad... The dad was really big into uh, learning different languages. So the dad was born in Saskatchewan, Canada. Right. Um, but he, uh, his parents immigrated during World War from Hungary. And uh, the, so my wife's grandfather used to work on railroads here in Canada, Canadian railroads. Mm -hmm. And um, so the dad was born in Saskatchewan and um he learned hungarian from his parents and would go to school in english and then moved to toronto for university and then had my wife and uh wanted my wife to also speak french because it's the second official language in canada yeah so Usually you can't do that unless one of the parent is French and went to school in French, but he wrote up to um, minister or whatever of the school board and was able to get her daughter to go to French school, even though 
usually it's not something that that's done okay and um so yeah he was pushing a lot for that so she started school going to school in french without knowing a word so she did her whole um elementary school high school up to university in french and uh was learning hungarian with her dad and also um weekend class she had uh i think portuguese because at some point the dad wanted to move to brazil for his research um, okay. ended up not doing it so he was really into making her learn different different languages yeah that's a lot going on at once <laughs> Yeah, she was really pushed as a as a child. She was an only child and was really pushed into um, ballet, piano, violin. She's been pl playing the violin since she was like three or four. She's really good. Jeez, yeah. Um, yeah, church and uh, learning different languages. So yeah, that's mad. That's a lot to put on one kid. Yeah. Hopefully she's uh, she's got three now to spread out the the stuff on but i'm sure she wouldn't be the same kind of parent oh, usually, no. you, usually you're not the same kind of parent as your father no, or, no matter you what go through yeah you go through things you learn and adjust and uh you're also your own individual right yeah. even though you were raised a certain way it's not necessarily that you're going to pass it on the same way to your children yeah yeah um so we'll talk some pipes then uh do you have uh are you still making pipes by the way no i'm not making. i've never did you never made. make pipes i thought i heard somebody had said that you you'd made a pipe and given them maybe i'm obviously no. confused with someone else sorry so do, no, you, okay. do you have your uh, favorite pipes what's that do you have a favorite pipe i have favorite pipes um i would say italian pipes are are my favorite mm -hmm. um I have a few, but mostly uh, I would say Radice, Castello, and Caminettos are really my my favorite pipes, and like probably the, probably the only two the the only brands I'll be buying in the future as well. Maybe I'll. Why have you made that conscious decision? Are you fed up with the uh, drilling flaws and Petersons and that type of modern day manufacturing? Oh, I've had the uh, had so many pipes before and i think i went up to almost 100 pipes at some point mm -hmm. at one point and then decided to get rid of of a bunch of them and um one of the main reason i i so the first phase was to get rid of of some pipes uh decided to go with savinelli because of the six millimeter filters mm -hmm. and then realized that I didn't really need the filters and then uh, started buying unfiltered pipes after that mm -hmm. again and um, happened to try the Castello and Caminettos and Radice's and uh, I, I just fell in love with with the, the craftsmanship and the, the work I, I in my opinion it's it's probably the the artisan of the factory pipes right because there's either artisan or factory pipes but I think these three brands are kind of like a bit of both because they're they're not like like Savinelli or Peterson. They're not mass produced, but mm -hmm. they still produce enough to be a factory. Yeah. But yeah. relatively small enough to have that artisan feel to them. Yeah. And uh, great quality of briar, great craftsmanship, and absolutely nothing wrong with any of those that I purchased. So. And uh, what made me go to less pipes actually was because I uh, I was just overwhelmed to be honest to be honest about like whenever I had to, I, I wanted to smoke a bowl is to de decide which tobacco and which pipe and uh, got into that rabbit hole of buying so much pipes and so much tobaccos that I pretty much did the same with my cellar where I instead of going wide I went deep um and got rid of a bunch of one-offs and tins that were you know i didn't really care for and uh didn't want to wait 10 or 15 or 20 years to get to that tin and realize that i've hold on to something that i just just don't like 
and don't enjoy. And so I, I got rid of a bunch and just added more to the ones that I already knew and liked. And so it, it really, uh, I think, brought my pipe smoking hobby to a whole new level where I can now enjoy it more than ever, I think, which yeah. is kind of odd by reducing the, the variety and the number of pipe. I tend to, I, I realize that I'm enjoying it more than ever because I know each of my pipes, I enjoy each of them, and I know every tobacco that I pick out from this cellar, I know what I'm getting into, and that's what I feel like smoking. Yeah, yeah. So not so much in discovering new blends and trying other pipes anymore. Um, just, yeah. And the, uh, the lyric from uh, Genesis song, I forget which one. I know what I like and I like what I know. Exactly. Yeah, perfect. No, I'm feeling that way, especially with tobacco as well. I've kind of, I'm kind of glad that I've narrowed down into that I do enjoy the more naturally nutty, toasty. You know, I'm I think I'm zoom or I'm zoning in more on burly blends and vapors, and I'm glad that I've come to that so soon so i know not to to delve into you know i'm not too fond of orientals or anything that's too heavy with latakia um or straight virginias usually but that um or like golden sliced recently for the like that's amazing that's an amazing virginia yeah and it, it's important to have a little bit of variety i mean sometimes you can get a little bit tired of smoking something or I, I like a variety for sure, but do I need, you know, 200 different blends? No. Um, variety can be, you know, I think I have about 40, maybe 40 or 50 different blends in my cellar. Um, but the ones that I really like, I have in like large quantities so that I don't have to worry about buying more in the future or yeah. add a few more, but yeah. And uh, see like, I'm not really big into Latakia blends and yeah. I decided that I wanted to stock up on two that I liked. And so I, I only have these two in my Latakia mixture, or actually three blends. So those are the ones that I, I have. I only have three Latakia mixtures and whenever I feel like having Latakia, I know it's one of those three. Yeah. And, uh, but I have more variety when it comes to uh, Virginia vapors because that's mainly what I like. Mm -hmm. have, you then, tried, have, you, have you tried Louisiana flake? Mm -mm. No, that's my next vapor to order. I'm really interested in that. Apparently it has a very slight cocoa topping, so that'll be unusual sure. for a vapor as well. It's a highly rated blend. Um, and I, I often get that, that question, people saying like, oh, have you tried this one? Have you tried that one? And I'm like, no. I, and honestly, I, I don't even want to try more tobaccos. Like I, I've tried so many and been disappointed. Yeah. And at this point, it's not because I, I'm, I'm wondering if, I, if I'm going to be disappointed. It's more... I get to ask my, I get to a point where I ask myself, okay, well, you know, if I, if I give in and try that blend and end up liking it, it's going to be one that I'm going to have to buy. And, yeah. and I'm already satisfied with what I have. So why would I chase for more? Right. There's, yeah. there's a point where you have to be comfortable and satisfied with what you have and start searching for more, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, you could just go on. You could just continue to try new blends and never settle down. And no, and I, mean, I, I sometimes get that, you know, the v vague anxiety about missing out on something, you know, or will I ever find the blend that I really do like that I haven't tried yet? You know, yeah. my my favorite is out there somewhere. I just haven't tried it. But try not to think that way. It's a bit stupid, really. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, the yeah. Uh, the divine ambrosia is out there somewhere and I'll never know about it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. But having 50 odd different blends, that's a large, still a large quantity to, to choose from. Yeah, maybe 50, 40 or 50. At one point I had a, a, an Excel spreadsheet with all the quantity and stuff and I wanted to know how much I had and, and for how long it was going to last me. Mm -hmm. 
only to realize only to realize that I still need to keep purchasing. But mm. <laughs> were we making a note every time you had a bowl of something, and then? No, no, it was just to know like today how much do I have and how how long it's going to last me, right? All right, all right, all right? I think I had, I don't know, somewhere around 70 pounds of tobacco in tins, roughly. That's enough. That's enough for a while. Enough for, I don't know, maybe a decade or two. <laughs> probably, probably close to, probably close to 20 years, but it's something I know I'm going to do all my, I'm, I'm going to be pipe smoking all my life. I've been doing it for years and it's just not something that I'm going to let go. It, it's, yeah. It's too beneficial, I think, for the mental side of things anyway. Yeah, absolutely. It's There's nothing that helped me more than that. Well, medication at, at some point because it was needed, but, uh, uh, and still, still medicated. But pipe smoking is really a, uh, a ritual and something I need in my day. Mm -hmm. um, not a need because it's a crave and I need the nicotine, but I need, that's what I said, I need the ritual. Yeah. I need the ritual in my daily. Um, it happened a couple times during my smoking um, <coughs> life, I guess as, as a smoker that I, I didn't smoke for a couple of days for, for various reasons. And I, I wasn't like, I didn't feel the difference. It's just that I needed that, that moment of, of ritual to unwind, but it's not like I was feeling any different or craving the need to, to, to smoke, you know, to, to have my fix. It's, it's more the ritual for me that if I had one pipe a day would be the morning one with my coffee. Mm -hmm. That's when I, I, I start my day slowly and uh, enjoy a pipe. Um, if I have a really, really stressful day, it's going to help me in the evening. But now that I'm working from home, I can't say that I have days where I'm like, it's so hectic and stressful that I need to sit down. But I usually have two pipes a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'll have between, well, two and usually three. Yeah, between three and four since working from home. But you, it usually would have been between two and three. The most important one for me is the evening. I don't really have a pipe in the morning. I, I wouldn't have a pipe until halfway through the working day, lunch. And That's what I used to do when I was working out, so like going out to the work building. My evening pipe was my, my well, that's the only one I could smoke. This morning was just going with the boys and everything and then going to work and then coming back. And then after supper was my ritual. My moment was after supper, enjoying a pipe. And now it's sort of, um, reverse to being a morning smoke because I, I come out I come out here, start working, start my day, and so I start with a, a pipe and a coffee and look at my emails, uh, organize my team, do my stuff, and then go have lunch, come back after lunch, have another bowl, and then sometimes I smoke one in the evening, but because I spent the whole day here, then the evening is usually with my like family, so. Yeah. What's the uh, out of interest where you're you're originally from? Then uh, their attitude towards uh, working lunch is it rather the same as the French? Would you have a glass of wine or two with lunch and get away with that? No. Well, if if um, if we go, I'm not I'm not really big on going out. I would usually stay in the office, <laughs> as you as I said before. It's kind of weird that I'm. You know, people might see me differently because they see me on YouTube and think that I'm outgoing and stuff. But I'm I'm more like I'd rather stay at work and be in my bubble than going out in a restaurant where it's like loud and stuff. Like I I get social anxiety when it to go in a place like that. And uh, but if 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 people go, say on a Thursday or Friday, they decide to go out have lunch, they'll have a beer or a glass of wine and then go back to work after. That's Right. It's not something you, you know, blab about when you come back to work, but it's known and it's, yeah. it's, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. That's not, not bad. Mm. But yeah, it's important to have a pipe at some point in your day anyway. So 
if you had to narrow it down to if you could give me your top three blends or your top one if you can't think of three um probably changes every so often does it mm, yeah um maybe or like golden slice if you ask me tomorrow it's going to be something else or i i could say m4 or berlin um any of the tobacco I have, really, I I have my favorite, so I I can name any of my favorite, like Escudo, maybe Deluxe, um, but really, uh, like I said before, it, it's more about the ritual. So, I mean, if you if you had to piss on the last jar of tobacco and and that's the on, only thing I had, I'd, I'd let it dry and pack my pipe. <laughs> <laughs> Right, it's all about the ritual and and whatever blend you'd give me, I I would get used to that blend and and learn how to smoke it properly. And as long as I have something that has two holes in it, I can stuff tobacco. I'll I'll make it my ritual and smoke it. <laughs> um, that's sort of like the cliche answer, but um, yeah, I I would go with one of my go to probably Escudo, maybe Deluxe. There you go, because I need that parika. I like that raisiny dark fruit, yeah, um, spiciness from the and the sweetness in this kudo. I think it's more well rounded. Um, so if I had to pick one, I guess I'll go with this kudo. Um, top two or three blends, I I would probably add um, Bob's chocolate because I like the that Lakeland. Uh, nutty chocolate and Bob's chocolate. It's always been one of my favorites. So if I had to pick one aromatic, um, either Ennerdale or Bob's chocolate would be good. I like that floral fruitiness and vanilla kind of from these blends. Um, second spot. I mean, it's it's hard. I know three would be Bob's chocolate. One would be a Scudo, but between that. I don't know. Pick pick one. Okay. M4 or Burley, or like Golden Slice, uh, any anything like that. Capstan Blue. Um, yeah. I, I can name a bunch. I don't think I ha I'm the kind of pipe smoker that has like one absolute favorite. I think I have a bunch of favorite because I like to rotate and, and dab into different blends. Mm -hmm. So like I said, today might be M4 M4 or Burley because that's what I'm smoking. Tomorrow might be Capstan Blue or Escudo. I think they're they're all they all have their place in my heart. So there's not one that I'm absolutely diehard fan of. Mm -hmm. I think I have a, a bunch that I that I appreciate and uh, and smoke on a regular basis. But those those are my my solid choice. Um, Capstan Blue, Escudo, um, Orlick. Those have been in my rotation for for a long time. Can you guys get Gawith over there? Gawith and Hogar, Hogarth? Well, I get I get all my tobacco from the states. So basically, Four Noggins is my go-to. So anything that's available at Four Noggins is is where I I get my stuff. Um, but if you're asking about like here in in the tobacco shops, uh, yeah, they do have Gawith in Canada. They, they you can get it in the um, pipes and cigar shops, but it's really expensive. You want to get into prices in Canada? Yeah, it's pretty bad. I was talking to Chris Rambling Dilettante about it. No, I was just going to mention St. James Flake has a lovely, hurric, figgy, plummy, lovely right up your street, I think, if you haven't tried it. Yeah, see my the three that I that I really go to in that in that um sort of profile would be Escudo. Um, the other one is uh, Camoy's Cast Number no. 7, which has the um, Virginia Perique on the outside, but it has a dark Cavendish plug in the middle. So just like Peter still could be uh, Bullseye Flake. Mm. And uh, Dunhill Dark Flake was a great play. I still have some. Um, and I, 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 I really wish that Peterson's going to come out with the, uh, the Dark Flake. I know it is in the in, in Europe, um, but it had, hasn't made it to the um, the U.S. yet. Hopefully, it's something that they're going to bring eventually. But I saw it on on UK website where they had the Peterson Dark Flake. That's mm -hmm. a really good one. 
We can always arrange sending some over to you, buddy. Oh no, I have now. Uh, I have plenty. <laughs> <laughs> but if I hope it's gonna come back in stock because I, I I have some, but it's something I'd like to to get more of for sure. Um, if ever you you see it, I I I definitely recommend trying it. It's a flake, Virginia Perique flake, and uh, it's a really good one. I had a really I stuffed a flake yesterday. It was actually Bob's chocolate, and and it must have only been the eighth or ninth time. I've had success with it out of, I don't know, 15 times. So maybe about five times it's failed, but the past three or four times it's, it's working. So what's think, your, what's your experience with it? It's, is it, why did you not like it at first? It did the, the well, taste no, or it's the, the, just the way I stuffed it in didn't work. It's not that I didn't like it. it it's just the, it had to be the draw hole was bunged or, it had to be scooped out and rubbed out again, but just not oh. doing it correctly or not drying the flake out properly. But it does, yeah. you, you get more flavor, don't you? You get a lot more. And and um, for someone like me, especially, ready rubs, I can smoke very fast. Like this is nearly done. And this was quite dry, so yeah. But um, the flake stuffed in, it's just gonna slowly burn slow and cool. And, and the flavor is more intense, I think. See, but Bob's chocolate is one that really, uh, it, it's it's one of a kind because it, it I I prepare it and smoke it the way I don't I I it, I don't think I do the same with any other blend. It's the only one that I treat that way. So I'm used to smoke to to rub out everything. Like sometimes I would do folding stuff with like thin, uh, thin McBaron flakes. Mm -hmm. Um, do fold and stuff but I usually I don't dry my tobacco to like a, a crispy dry but I, I like to get some of the extra moisture out of the tobacco before I pack it in or else the moisture is going to end up going this way it's mm -hmm. just a matter of you know it, it is what it is you pack something wet then it's, it's going to smoke wet mm -hmm. so trying to remove some of that moisture before you pack it in is one one major or the i think the most important thing to do but bob's chocolate was drying it and then at one point it was not dried and i i just loaded a bowl and had one of the best bowl of bob's chocolate i've ever had in years and i was like wait a minute was i drying that tobacco for nothing this mm. whole time and now i just take it out of the jar and it's wet more wet than i would smoke any other tobacco but i thoroughly rub it out like rub it out to the like the, the to the max like the most i can and then make sure that they're all separated by little ribbons and i i pack it not too tight and it smokes nice and dry and i get a whole lot more flavors yeah. out of it so it, it's just a try and trial and error sometimes eh? you have to see what works for you and stick with that absolutely um i have a pipe that uh, really works with the chocolate flake as well. It's just funny how certain pipes will bring out the flavor as well. Like how, like how does that even work? Yeah, and I'm more, I, I'm, I usually more into like, you know, the, the billiards and the, the narrow tall bowl kind of like pretty much all my pipes are Canadian. That kind of, Love that. You know, those billiards. But for some reason that Bob's chocolate just smokes best in, in a, a a, a wide shorter bowl um mm. as opposed to a tall one i guess it's it helps not to build not to build moisture right mm -hmm. so the fact that it's a, a shorter bowl doesn't build as much moisture and it has enough room to breathe as well so yeah that must be it yeah the pipe is a like a squattish bulldog so yeah yeah I'm like that, but I, I'm not using it for Bob's, but that's a that's a nice uh, Castello that I like for uh, Burley blends or Kentucky. That's beautiful. Yeah, so that that's the kind of pipe I would smoke Bob's chocolate in, like a wider, shorter bowl. Yeah. That's a lovely, I love the rim around that. Yeah, I really like smooth rim. Um, so that's one of my favorite pipe, but it has a, a sandblasted rim. Um, yeah. I don't know, and all, 
most of my pipes have blasted rim, but I, I really prefer a smooth rim just to get it clean. And as you smoke it, there's no bits and pieces of tobacco that get into the, the sandblasted areas, but mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect pipe for me is a sandblast with a smooth top. Mm. I have another one here on my desk. That's another. Oh, that's a nice cherry wood. Yeah, sandblasted and it has a smooth top. That's a Caminetto. That's lovely. And I, I like I like these ones. That those are the ones I have on my desk right now because they all they all sit, mm -hmm. and uh, it's easy for me to just drop them on the desk and keep working and then go back to my smoke. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Beautiful. Let's see. Did you ever dabble with any snuff, chew, dip, snooze? Mm -mm. No. Any cigars? Uh, cigars, yeah. Um, cigars, I tried a couple of times and then really got into cigars at one point when family members came back from Cuba and had some Cubans that I really... Um, got into that not because of Cuban cigars but mostly mainly because I I was a pipe smoker now mm -hmm. and so I sort of applied what I learned from the pipe smoking to um, smoking a cigar whereas before I didn't really know what I was doing cigars and there is a way to smoke a cigar mm -hmm. and so by you know toasting the foot and taking my time and now that I knew how to smoke a pipe and enjoy and taste the tobacco, I could really do the same with the cigar. I, it was a whole different experience uh, from uh, what I experienced before. So it, it was um, an eye opener for me of, of like another world to explore in terms of, of premium tobaccos. And cigars is, is really something I enjoy. Um, but not nearly as close as, as pipes. I, I just like the texture. I like the ritual. I like everything about pipe smoking. But I do love my cigars, especially on the hot days, summertime, where, where I, I mean, last summer I smoked more, probably more cigars than I did uh, smoke my pipe, especially on hot, humid days. You don't feel like dealing with the, the moisture and the hot, mess in your pipe and just smoking a cigar working around doing stuff around the house barbecue whatever it's just easier yeah and more enjoyable when it's hot and you sit with a cold drink and a, a cigar is just something i really enjoy yeah. yeah good man um so cubans then be preference or do you like some dominican mm. republics or, i actually know. don't like cubans mm -hmm. the, the um, quality has gone down in the past especially in the past five years soils and stuff I mean, a good a good age cuban is good don't get me wrong I, I know how to you know i know when it's a good tobacco and a good product but i my personal experience and i've tried i had a, a humidor full of cubans different cubans they're really expensive and i think um one they have to be aged or else they taste very young they have a, a particular flavor profile to them um, that's very unique to Cuban, but they have to be aged to be really good. And um, if you're to buy single Cubans, you, it's like flipping a coin, whether you're going to have a good smoke or not. Um, if you buy a box of 20, there's at least five, six, seven that are pretty much unsmokable because they're plugged or there's issues so the consistency and how they're being rolled um is is just not comparable to uh non-cubans and th that's my opinion so i i really um yeah nicaraguan tobaccos are uh good and habano wrapper is probably my my favorite habano wrapper with a Nicaraguan uh, binder and a mix of Nicaraguan and Dominican filler is probably my best cigar. Um, I also like Maduro's, like the Arturo Fuente Maduro cigar. It's very smooth and creamy. Okay. Um, but yeah, I would say non-Cuban. And if I had to pick one company, I would probably go with Arturo Fuente. Nice. Always good smoke, quality, consistency, how they're rolled and 
they have a good profile of, of different um, different types as well. So mm -hmm. it's a solid company for me. Yeah. Do you have a big humidor then? Lots of bovetas sitting in there. I, you, I used to have a, a humidor, like a fridge, a wine door. Uh, it's like a wine fridge, but turned into a cigar humidor. Oh, cool. Recently sold it. Um, main reason is it, it was unplugged all the time because it's not hot enough here to have uh, to require a, a fridge, you know, to to lower down the temperature. Mm -hmm. So by having it unplugged, the temperature was fine. So I was like, why would I keep that expensive unit if I'm not using it for what what it's made for, which is to cool down the temperature? And also found out that when you um, when the temperature is too cold, your cigars are drying out quick more quickly. So you have to raise the the humidity level because uh, cold air is more dry. Right. So yeah. the, the colder it is, the the more uni hum humidity you need, and so um, I I found it to be more complicated than uh, something you have to monitor and monitor and check on all the time. So I went back to just uh, airtight containers with Bovetta packs in there, and yeah, you basically forget about it. It's probably the best setup or the best thing you can do if you're into cigars. Save your money on save your money to buy cigars rather than than in the furniture because they'll bring more trouble than anything else. So just airtight containers with Bovetta packs is is all you need. Yeah, that's what I've been doing. Yeah, I've never had a decent humidor. But I have friends who are big into cigars and spend five, six hundred pounds or nearly a thousand dollars on a humidor. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. Save the money for the cigars is right. You can do perfectly well with your mummy's Tupperware. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hmm. Do you have a favorite cigar or favorite cigars? I do. I'm not for Cubans. Like I've never had a Monte Cristo number two, for example, or the I, I'm not big in the Cuban myself anyway, so the Dominican Republic appealed to me, and my favorite would be the Balmoral range. But this is a, I, I don't have an extensive knowledge yeah. in, in about cigars, but I, I uh, from what I've tried, there's Balmoral, they have a three year aged uh, cigar. I have no idea what it, well, couldn't even tell you what the binder and wrapper is, and, but I know, it, I know it's good. And it's pretty reasonably priced as well, these things, especially in Holland. So the, the wife's Dutch and her father, he would smoke the, he doesn't like the three years, I think, or I think he prefers just their regular range, but it's cheap over there as well. Like you're talking about three euros for a stick. And mm. Over here, uh, probably about eight pounds, 12 US dollars. I don't know what it would be. What's the US dollar to Canadian dollar exchange rate? Uh, I think it's about 0.72. So for uh, 72 cents US, it's a dollar Canadian. All right. That's quite a difference. Yeah. At the moment, anyway, yeah. Hmm. But no, I've only heard to uh, pops. The euro and British pounds is even more worth more than the US. So yeah, yeah, our exchange is good at the minute, especially if we're buying from the US. Yeah, do so. you get from the US, or you buy like where? Where do you usually get your without naming a, a website or a place? Do you order elsewhere? Or? I've done uh, once or twice. I've been speaking with uh, Northeast Piper Mark. And he's given me the name of a, a site that's definitely good to use. So I'll, I'll be trying them. There's a lot of, uh, you hear a lot of people with their ideas, keep it under 200 grams and it'll get past customs, all that stuff. But that's bullshit. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. It just, you just, it's just luck of the draw. But apparently there's a couple of sites who will market as tea and stuff like that, you know. 
Yeah, it's, it's luck unless you order from a company that does ship friendly. If they <laughs> ship friendly, then they'll get to you safe and sound. I've never had issues. I've been ordering from that place for, I don't know, over six years now and um, never had any issues. Yeah. No, when I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to make another order from the U.S. soon, I think. But I kind of want to be happy with what we have here as well. The prices are not too bad either, right? Not too bad. Not as bad as uh, down south across the border. It's it's worse, and but it's not getting any cheaper every day or every quarter. It goes up. So yeah, it's about fifteen pounds now for fifty grams of tobacco, which is about twenty US dollars. So it's expensive enough. It's about, but be more expensive in Canada. But the Americans have it good, don't they? I've seen. You know. yeah, see what what's what's what what's reasonable about the price is in in like for you is you can actually not break the bank if you want to try a couple of pins to see if you like before um, yeah. stocking on stocking up on on them and then sell it and then you can go and buy it from you know those websites in the U.S. that are going to ship friendly. Yeah, for me to just go out and buy a tin to try. Like I may as well just order it from the states and throw it in the garbage, if or pass it on. Like I wouldn't throw it. I, I've given tobaccos more than uh, more than my share of tobaccos to people when you know whenever I didn't like something. But yeah. it, it's I, I'd rather pay nine dollars and and discard to you know give it to somebody I you know as a gift yeah. rather than pay fifty dollars to try here and like if you don't like it it's pretty expensive for for one tin right yeah yeah it's no good no oh dear it's insane they're killing it i know i wish they would make a distinction between cigars and pipes and pipe tobacco and then cigarettes the yeah. government they would never backtrack on, on what they're doing and i mean the science is in even you know the obviously the the uh, the stuff from the 60s and 70s the research that actually said uh, you live longer if you're a pipe smoker in the end <laughs> but uh, even the more recent research is that's been two done. years younger two years longer really yeah but even the most the more recent research I mean sure uh, you've got links to all sorts of things if you're not inhaling your pipe tobacco and you're yeah, you ru you run the gauntlet with everything in life, don't you? So it's up to you to make a, a decision. But the whole thing with nicotine addiction and cigarettes, it needs to be separated. But they would never do that. Yeah, especially vape with uh, kids now. I know my son has a he had a presentation, uh, a Zoom presentation because now they're doing. Um, school like homeschooling for a week they decided to they decided to send the kids home a week before Christmas uh, but then do homeschooling for for that week to sort of slow down the progress of the, the virus right so that's one yeah. of the things that they did and then uh, one day my uh, the one that's in he's in seventh grade so first year of high school and uh, they had a they had a Zoom meeting, and it was uh, someone that was talking about uh, vaping and the risk and all that. Because apparently, there's almost one out of two um, kids that are doing vape at his school. So like fifty percent, and and it's so easy. And I was asking like, what? How how do how can they afford to buy that? Because you know the, the that juice with the nicotine, like you know, isn't there like a high tax on that? Like like pipes and pipe tobacco and cigars? And they were like, no, it's super affordable. You can get those pens that are from like made in China. They're already pre-filled. You can't you reuse them. It's like a disposable one. And it says everyone sells them at the school. Like some people get their hands on some. They sell them for a few bucks. And I was like. See, that's that's what doesn't make sense is they have access to these crappy things. Yeah. And yet the reason to raise the taxes on premium stuff that they wouldn't, you know, I, 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 I don't see a 12 year old going into uh, or asking someone to go into a cigar store store and get him a, you know, like 
the fifteen dollar cigar. Yeah. Um, and if they do, good for them because <laughs> it's actually better than what they're putting in their lungs, and they they won't they won't inhale a cigar. And if they do, they'll they'll stop very soon because yeah. they'll get sick before they pass the you know <laughs> the first third of the cigar. So I, it's it's just nonsense to me. Yeah. Right. But um, just same as you wouldn't see a twelve year old walking around with a pipe clenched in his mouth going to school, right? No. So, imagine, imagine. Next yeah. time you go into the pipe store, there's a kid outside asking you to grab me a tin of deluxe navy rolls, would you, mate? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> there's five I'd bucks. I'd be like, sure, sure, I'll buy it for you. It's on the house, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's mad, but they will never. I don't see them going back on it. No, they can't. Do you smoke your pipe in public then at all, usually? Walking uh, Usually at home. It's it's like, I, again, to go back on my ritual, it's something I do on my own to relax on wine and start either start my day with a coffee or end my night with, you know, a pipe. Um, but I, I wouldn't be embarrassed or shy to, to go out and bring my pipe in public. I did it a couple times before um, when I was still at work uh, last summer or so. Brought a pipe with me and then after like waiting for my wife to pick me up or something, I would just sit outside and enjoy a bowl. Um, so it's not something that bothers me. It's just that there's nowhere I can smoke my pipe. That's the that's the problem because it's yeah. banned everywhere. You can't you just can't smoke anywhere. So right. It's hard to find a spot to smoke, right? Even in parks and stuff in Canada, you're not allowed to smoke. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. No, you're not allowed. And if you smoke, like, uh, you know, in in downtown where I work, it's it's building and and restaurants and stuff like that. And you have to be um, nine meters away from any door entrance. So how can how can you be on the sidewalk and be nine meters away from any doors? Like, there's just no way. No. Even if you stand in the middle of the road, you're not going to be nine meters away. <laughs> so, and and uh, so there are a few areas, but then when you get to a public park, and it's um, you can't because it, the parks are owned by the government or the city or whatever, and it's banned. Like cigarettes is not uh, well. They treat everything as like there's a cigarette sign with a a, a mark on them, so that includes any smoking thing pipe cigar cigarette vape whatever so yeah oh, it applies to vape as well Jeez. yeah everything that is pretty harsh pretty hard going yeah that is mad get this yeah. get the mcbaron what is it yeah classic amber going I was I was saying that there's no tobacco I want to try, but that, there's actually one that came out that picked my interest, and I'd like to stock up on a few for for later. It's the um, even though I'm not an aromatic, see it's it goes against two like two strikes against me is I I'm not one to want to try new tobaccos, mm -hmm. and I'm not into aromatics, but this one breaks the rule twice where I want to buy that one and I'm I I can't wait for it to be available where I get my stuff is uh, McBaron roll cake vanilla mm. which is apparently a uh, virginia burley with a little bit of cabinet um kentucky with a madagascar vanilla um and apparently mm. it's very nice so, it certainly sounds nice yeah it does and so something I, I i don't know i would see myself like when i i saw it i was like oh man i i, I wish i could smoke it like now during Christmas time, it's something that just appeals to me. Smoke with a coffee and have that little bit of vanilla, but still the natural tobacco. McBaron are good at that. I'm yeah, like, yeah, they are. Aside from the Seven Seas, which I wouldn't touch, those those are American style aromatic. But mm -hmm. anything else that McBaron does really focuses on the natural tobacco. Even though sometimes they add casing to it, it's just to enhance the. Yeah, I don't know whatever experience or top like top note or or slightly flavor that they want to add to it yeah um but they do it in a really nice and natural way and so when i heard about that virginia kentucky and vanilla i was like hmm, it's 
sounds like a spicy vanilla cake that I, I would just enjoy right now during the holidays, but it's not going to happen, but I'll, I'll make sure to grab some when it comes available and I'll, I'll have it for next year. It'll get to st sit in the cellar a little bit. Yeah. Get a bit of beige on it. <laughs> yeah. Any plans for the holidays? Going to my mother's. Sorry, this lighter's running low, so I'm gonna have to shake it up a bit, even though it's a zippo. Yeah, going to my mum's. Um, my sister has a health condition, so she'll not be there. She's shielding. Um, it's a, she had a heart valve transplant many years ago, so she's just oh, wow. doesn't want to interfere with that. Um, all good now like she has to be checked up on every so often and she had a checkup there recently and they don't need to do anything don't need to open up the gearbox again this this time around so that's that's good anyway but yes yeah, she's just being wise about it and, and staying at home this year with her two nephews or my two nephews her two twins twin boys so they're eight years old now or seven coming eight, they'll be eight in February. And um, so I think, yeah, she's just being wise. My brother will be there with his um, daughter and son who are both toddler age. So that'll be good. And his wife, she's dead on, she's good crack. So it'll be me, my mum, my dad, and my brother, sister-in-law and the two children. And then, yeah, that's it, that's it. But our little, we're allowed to mingle with uh, three different households, I think the the government have said. But uh, yeah. so yeah, that's it. But there'll be a lot of people. Sorry, go on. No, no, go on. I was just going to say there'll be a lot of people breaking the rules. I'm sure. Yeah, same here. I think our government was uh, uh, watching closely about what the the, the um, German government is doing. Um, I think they're having success, so they're they're really looking at what's being done over there. At first, they announced that we could do sort of like you, three family, uh, three household, um, max of ten people, mm -hmm. and then they changed that to being not allowed. So you're only allowed to be in your household. So it's only like my wife and I and the kids. We can't have people over, and we can't be we can't go anywhere. Um, because of the raise, like it doubled. I think daily we had like a, a thousand cases and now it's like 2,000 to 2,500 every day. So they had to they had to do something to, to slow down the progress. So, yeah. It's gonna be a tight one this year then. That's crazy, that those figures, that's mad. Yeah, especially on the, uh, like the ratio of like the, our population, uh, the the number of cases versus the 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 population like if you think of the U S you know there are 320 million people uh, versus here in Quebec we're like I don't know five eight millions I think mm -hmm. so to have a thousand cases every day is 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 significant for the health system yeah so a lot of a lot of surgeries and other um, medical uh, intervention or I don't know how to say that but a lot of other medical things that they need to do such as surgeries are now being pushed because of they they have to use the the nurses and the the resources that they have to focus on COVID cases so there's a lot of things falling behind and people waiting to get different tests done and different surgeries so some people don't get why they do the, the close down and stuff. It's not necessarily because there's a, you know, high um, percentage of, of, of you dying from COVID. It's because the more cases we have, the more the system gets um, impacted by the COVID cases. And now everything else is, is impacted by that. And yeah. I think a lot of people just don't get that. Yeah. A lot, a lot are flying now uh, to... Uh, because they can't celebrate here, 
they're actually organizing get-togethers in in Cuba and Mexico, and so they're they're going to to these places now. So they're flying out elsewhere, which is nonsense, right? They're going to get trapped out there. Uh, no, they're allowed. The they're, the government's saying they're going to be strict when they come back, right? So they're they're going to follow up and monitor and but so much you can do i think to monitor people coming back so there's just increasing the risk of of catching something and spreading it when you come back mm -hmm. I, just did, I just think it's irresponsible for people to do that it certainly is yeah yeah it's pretty selfish in my opinion yeah but they have the right to so they exercise their right to travel that's it unfortunately a lot of people still don't believe it as well you know or yeah. yeah. Until someone I, in their I, I family. Certainly, I mean, I shouldn't say it like that. What I mean is the whole thing as a hoax. I mean, there's no doubt there's coronavirus and it is, exists and it is taking its toll on everyone. But our government over here, I don't think, are dealing with it particularly well. But over there, Canada and the States, where you have those figures of people getting unwell um, and people are still gathering in huge numbers for protests and things like that. Maybe a bit more responsible in Canada, but certainly not in the States. I think that's where we need to draw the line is that, that there are some people that just don't believe in COVID, but some believe, some people believe, they, they, they know it's a fact that COVID exists, but perhaps they're not, um, they don't agree with the way it's, it's being, um, the restrictions and the lockdowns and the economy going down because of that. So they they might not be um, they not they might not agree with the decisions that the governments are making. It's not that they don't believe in COVID. It's just the way it's being managed and um, the way they're dealing with it is where they disagree. And I get I I understand that. We can always have you know different ways to to, to view things, and that's that's totally valid. Mm -hmm. To me, the, the nonsense is people not believing in COVID. That's like, come on. <laughs> it's a bit late in the game for that. Yeah. What about you? Have the kids got everything they wanted then? Is Santa being nice to them this year? Mm. Yeah. Santa being nice. I'm Santa. <laughs> so they had a gift yesterday. We sort of gave in. Um, my wife didn't want to. And then I was like, well, you know what? If we give it tonight, they'll at least have something they can use for the next two or three days. And as opposed to, you know, unwrap everything within five minutes and be overwhelmed and not really, not that they wouldn't care, but you, you're sort of overwhelmed with everything that you don't get to appreciate every single gift that you receive. Yeah. And I think it was a good idea, actually. We let them unwrap one gift each yesterday. And um, Did they know what it was, though, or was it lucky dip? No, no, no. It was, it was pure surprise. They had no idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, all three of them really enjoyed and used them already. And uh, so the two oldest got a... Uh, a it's a uh, hair and body clipper, like a um, razor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like an all-in-one where they you can you know trim your your beard, your hair, like a a full body groomer. Mm -hmm. And so I showed my twelve year old how to get get rid of the peach fuzz last night. So I <laughs> showed my son how to how to shave and how to trim, and then. Um, yeah, it was, it was funny. We, we had good conversation and you, uh, yeah. And, uh, so it's, yeah, they, him and, uh, the oldest is 17 also got one. It wasn't his first one, but he was, he needed an, an, a new one. Um, so they both used it last night and they, they were super happy. They wanted one and, uh, the little one received a, um, we gave him a little, um, sort of like a drone, but it's it's a very small one. And once you 
you sort of drop it, it stays on its own, and then you direct it with your your hands rather than uh -huh. having a controller. Cool. And so he's he's been having fun with that last night and all day today. So it's like I said, they got to actually try it and appreciate them, and then then all their gifts are going to be tomorrow, or actually no, on the twenty fourth, on the evening. So. I'm glad they got to enjoy these gifts before and fully, you know, use them. And do you usually do presents on Christmas Eve then? Uh, yeah, usually it's, uh, usually we go out, we would go out on the 24th and then the morning of the 25th, when we wake up, we sort of like have a, a breakfast and, uh, you know, just wearing our pajamas we go to the living room and open all the gifts mm -hmm. that's usually what we do because they when we go out they already get gifts from siblings and other family members like on my side and stuff, like grandma and uncle and stuff they give stuff so there's no point of bringing our gifts there as well mm -hmm. it's too much so we split it and like they get the other people's gift on the 24th and then the 25th in the morning we do a just a family yeah, gathering in the, in the living room with our breakfast and coffee and i we just watch them open their gifts it's good to break it up like that as well yeah yeah so nothing gets lost in the in the noise <laughs> oh yeah and then they you're you're elsewhere and they want to open and start playing and then you have pieces and you know, flying everywhere and you have to collect all these pieces before leaving and yeah. make sure you didn't leave anything behind. It's, uh, yeah. And what about you? Have you asked Santa for any pipe related paraphernalia? I wish. I was telling my wife that. I said, I, I, I wish one day you're going to get me something. She's like, you're so picky that I, I don't know what to, what to get you. And because I, I, I it's true like it's it's even hard for me to decide like you know when i want something or when i look for something to make up my mind and then pull the trigger on something so i can understand for someone to go out and buy without knowing anything about you know the hobby is is can be hard yeah um, I, I think it'd be easier if you know if we were in a in a country like in the U.S. where my wife could walk into a brick and mortar and say, you know, my husband likes these three brands of pipes, and that's usually what I see. Like, you know, those tobaccos laying around. What what do you think I should buy him? They can actually tell her about like, oh, how about you, you know, give him a tamper or a lighter, or here's a little kit you can put together, and you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a three hundred dollar pipe, but there's bits and bobs you can buy right yeah, yeah um but we don't have that so for her to go online and pay like 20 dollars us shipping to buy something that she doesn't even know what like she she wouldn't even know what to search for and where to look so it's yeah. it's kind of the same so. with steph so steph has got me some uh victorian era clay pipes uh i'm really looking forward to tinkering around with those and uh good tasting pipes yeah, absolutely. And what else? There's another, like a ceramic bowl from, uh, it's like a traditional Ukraine um, ceramic bowl and wooden stem, uh, which has got a bit of age to it as well. And then the third, there's another type of pipe that I can't remember, or I don't think she told me what it was, just so there is an element of surprise. Yeah. So you know how to clean the, uh, the, those clay pipes? They never ghost, they, and there's a way to clean them, uh, to or to de-ghost them and clean the, you know, when start accumulating some cakes inside. Mm -hmm. um, How'd you do that? You literally put it in the fire. Oh yeah. Uh, either yeah, on like coal when when the fire goes out and there's that that the embers. Yeah, you yeah. stick it in there. And uh, it's just gonna burn out everything that's in there and turn into powder. Or you can put it in the oven on broil for right. for a bit, and they're yeah, because it's all, a cook. All the tars will just come out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how you clean them. I actually heard about that when I was looking into. Uh, I was 
I had one at one point and then Mersham and how to care for them. And then someone mentioned that the, a lot of uh, tobacco blenders, master blenders, that's what they use to source different tobaccos and also to taste different tobaccos. And I heard uh, two people, including Russ Willette at uh, Pipes and Cigars in the States. Yes. Uh, he mentioned that in a, um, on a video, I, I don't remember where I saw that, but he said that's how he cleans his pipes when when he makes a, a barbecue using uh, those charcoal and he's done making food. He just removes the grill and puts his clay pipes right in the on the um, on the charcoal, and that's yeah. how they get clean. Is you you burn all the tar and whatever was in in the pipe turns into dust. So. That's yeah. interesting. That's good to know. Thank you. I'll yeah. know how to get rid of the ghosts. <laughs> Something bad happens. It's not my suggestion. It's Russ Willett's, by the way. <laughs> From, <laughs> if, I'll not come back. If it, if it works great, then I take credit for the tip. But <laughs> if it doesn't, it's not my fault. No. <laughs> uh, I heard it from a guy. <laughs> yeah. Every, everything cooked on the barbecue tastes like, uh, like Amphora original. <laughs> that'd be good for me but not the friends <laughs> yeah well if your chicken ends up tasting like old dark fire it might not be a bad thing it's just gonna be a a mesquite barbecue type of flavor <laughs> on the chicken <laughs> yeah <laughs> steph might be like why does my chicken taste like tobacco <laughs> new seasoning darling <laughs> you wouldn't understand it took me years to perfect this yeah I burned the heck out of my clay pipe and just sprinkled the ashes on your steak. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have many friends or you, um, who smoke pipes or are you, you a member of any pipe club then? Or is that in introversion? I can't, that doesn't appeal to you anyway. I don't know of any pipe club. Uh, I've only had pipes with um, a friend of mine that I haven't seen for a while now. He's a tattoo artist. Um, we've been together a couple times and enjoyed a couple pipes uh, together in the past, but because of everything happening with COVID, we haven't been able to, to see each other much. Um, and I'm, I was planning on seeing uh, Algonquin Briar. He's uh, someone that, he has a channel, but doesn't make videos, but he comments and watches a lot of- Yes, you know, I'm familiar with his name. Yeah. yeah, he gets involved in the comments and he's really nice, really nice guy. Yeah. I've had a few emails back and forth and we've we've sort of messaged each other a couple of times, did some trades and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking forward to meet with Pierre at, at some point. His name is Pierre. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to meet him at some point. He lives in Ontario, maybe 45 minutes from me. Yeah. Um, but again, it just didn't happen. But there's no pipe clubs or anything that I I'm aware of and even if there's one um, there's no place that there's nowhere we can actually smoke inside so perhaps the reason why there's there are no pipe clubs is you can't meet up anywhere unless you'd meet up at someone's house yeah I think the, there are certain hotels that still have like smoking areas in, in this country and so people I think there are clubs that still exist I'm gonna try and uh, after yeah. COVID, see if that's something that's feasible for me to, to do. I'm going to try to mute some messages that have been... You're very popular. Like, why have you finished work, you bastard? Yeah, they've been messaging each other, and now it's like just... There's a, a ding sound that, that happens. Yeah, employees messaging each other, and I'm I'm on the messages it's all, do you guys use teams mm -hmm. yeah microsoft Teams. so that's there's a group there and there two employees just in uh added me to some message exchange that they they're doing that's why it's it's popping that i'm i've muted them now we're good you mentioned your friend there uh, as tattoo artist you're uh, quite substantially inked uh, have you space left? For oh yeah, lots of space left. Good, good. 
Yeah, I still have. Uh, I'm, the next one is probably going to be something pipe related. There's that empty spot on my arm. That's the, the the only space I have on my arm. Everything else is like covered both mm -hmm. both sides. Um, but I, I do have a space here where I'd like to have maybe a, a pipe or something related. Yeah, cool. Uh, uh, other than that, I'd, I'd probably like to have a chess piece at some point. Um, I've got bits here and here, but I don't have anything in the middle. So Yeah, I've been debating whether I, because I wanted some at, at, at some point, but the tatty, one of the tattoo artists was saying, like, you should save that the chess for like a, a big piece rather than going with one and then you're limited to what you can do after. But my, my issue with that is I don't want to get into like having a, a big piece anymore, like get into like a big, you know, few sessions uh, long. I, I, I'd rather stick with like max three, four five hours and get it done in one session and being done with. So I think the pipe is, is something I'd like to do and then I'll see after that. But yeah, I'd, I'd like to get a pipe tattooed on me. I haven't any pipe related tattoos. Probably in a traditional way or neo-traditional, probably stick to something nice and nice and simple, just classic. Yeah. Yeah. A nice billiard shape down your arm would go nicely there. Yeah. Probably a bent billiard. Uh, I actually have a bent billiard from my dad, um, and uh, I was prob I was thinking of bringing that pipe and ask the my friend to like draw that based on the pipe, and then yeah, have it tattooed. Um, yeah, I do have a a couple pipes that are really uh, important to me. There's one my dad never really smoked a pipe, but I think he had it in his mouth unlit more than he had it lit because <laughs> the the stem is chewed up like there's there's tooth marks on the stem but the bowl is not even charred yet so I don't know I think he was just walking around with a pipe in his mouth without just to be in in the 70s right <laughs> just to fit in but he didn't he never packed a bowl and smoked it um, but yeah, I kept that pipe and it was made in Canada. It's a Brigham pipe made in Canada. Okay. So, um, and it, it was, uh, always showcased like in a, in a bookcase on a little rack and, uh, something I've seen since I was little. So, and I have it now. So I put it in a, um, a display cabinet with a glass door where there's my dad's pipe. Mm -hmm. There's uh, my birth year pipe and my three boys' birth year pipe. So I bought one from 18, uh, 1981, which is my birth year, and uh, my boys 2003, 2008, and 2012. Like those pipe of the year that says the year on the pipe. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so I have that. Those so, fellows or uh, Radicis? Or? No, actually, they're, uh, one is a Big Ben uh from 2003 that's the first one and then uh, the other two are stanwell pipe of the year so there's a little silver plate on them with the uh, the the uh the year engraved mm -hmm. um and uh i try to i think one of them is on smoked but my goal was to smoke them on their birthday every year and then when they get old enough they'll it's something that's going to be theirs for like later as a I don't know. They want to remember me as a pipe smoker or something they can hold on to that that mm -hmm. I uh, that belong to me and has a connection with them because it's their birth year. The pipe was made the year they were born, so I think it's uh, I don't know something cool. I thought of collecting. Like it. Yeah, it's special. Yeah, and I saw on your on your live broadcast the other day. Instead of simply getting your son's uh, names tattooed on you you had the the the, the jam jar very interesting yes. i love yeah. i love how uh you know that's yeah. really individual and nobody else would know yeah this strawberry jam jar yeah it's really nice really nicely done it's hard to see with the shirt that i'm trying to pull up but <laughs> yeah it's a jam jar with strawberries and then there's jam written underneath Oh. It's James then, isn't it, James? 
Uh, no, it's it's all three of them. The the first oh. letter of each name. So it's Jacob, Alec, and Miko. Jacob, Alec, and Miko. Yeah. There you go. Don't know why. I thought it was James. Yeah. No, it's good that it means something to you as well. Yeah. Well, pretty much all tattoos. It's it's either related to uh, my wife, my kids, or um, well, actually, that that's the one for sort of my yeah, wife it's like, like all, a, all the women in your life you were explaining on that yeah it's i wanted something that that wasn't a portrait but not a cartoonish so it's sort of a mix between the two it's sort of a port portrait looking cartoon neo-traditional like it's a mix but you can't look at it and think it's it's someone but it represents like just more symbolic than uh a portrait yeah so something i wanted and then there's three skulls which represent each each of my boys mm -hmm. and um but it, it, every tattoo is something that either i went through uh in my life and wanted to sort of mark that that milestone or something that i overcome mm -hmm. uh, or overcame and then um sort of to keep me grounded and and remind of certain things that you know so it's all all related to like something important, but um, important, but I not necessarily want a tattoo because of a certain reason. Like this one on this arm, there's no there's no specific uh, reason. It's a it's an owl. It's kind of hard to see with the the light, but you can make it up the with the monocle. Yeah, there's a, a classic hat with like a skull and then the monocle and goes down. There's no reason for that one. I had it sketched. Uh, I had the idea, told them I want an owl, but I don't want like that cute owl on the branch, right? So mm -hmm. <laughs> something more manly. And so he, because of the pipe smoking and the, the hats and the style that I have, he sort of drew that with the monocle and the mustache and... um yeah, so this one, you know, there's no particular reason. I just wanted an owl and got it done. So not all of them have like a deep thought into it, um, but most of them do. Uh, aside from that's the only one, uh, all the other ones have a, a strong meaning. Yeah. Um, but all that to say, I'm not the type of person that gets tattooed necessarily because I want something deep. It can be just something because I want it. Yeah spontaneity as well yeah my wife my wife has a good one uh, we both got the the date in latin roman numerals of our wedding just the date here yep. but uh, it's she has it in uh, like a stick of lavender on the top of her chest here on her on her uh, what do you call that bone your collarbone because uh, lavender was part of the flowers that uh, she had on the wedding day and so she's always had lavender as a significant flower in her life. I think she was handed some or her mother got some as a gift when she was born and then so on and so forth. It just popped up, which leads me to my next question. Then if uh, the number three has some pertinent significance in your life and uh, do things come in threes for you or what, what was it to do with the, the number three? Oh, the threes. Oh yeah. I remember now saying that. Yeah. It's, um, well, actually one of my, one of the tattoo that I have is on my shin mm -hmm. and, uh, it's a, a dagger with roses and uh, I got it done with my, um, after my cousin passed away. Okay. So people that were not on my life can get a little, a little snap of what it is so it's a dagger with roses and on the side it says and and i don't know if you can see it well there you go very nice so on, on the side it says n33 and so what happened was um my cousin was pretty much uh, had a health condition all his life and had to um, um had to do, go to the hospital for like a laser sort of a laser surgery to burn something on his vocal cords pretty much every six or eight weeks. So he had like hundreds of, hundreds of, of uh, laser surgery over a period of uh, almost 30 years. 
and uh, developed a cancer at some point. And uh, he uh, ended up getting to the final um, stage of his life uh, right before Christmas. And so he passed away on December 30th um, of that year when he passed away. So that was uh, six years ago. Mm -hmm. So he passed away on December 30th, which 30th is three and December is one, two. So one plus two equals three. And he was 33 years old. Right. Right. And three months after on uh, March 3rd, which is the third day of the third month Mm -hmm. was my birthday and I was turning 33. Right. Yeah. So it's a lot of threes that are just coincidental. Um, yeah. So I, I got that 33 tattooed there because he was 33 when he passed away. I turned 33 three months after that. And uh, his name was Nick, Nicholas. And uh, he was also playing baseball all his life. So it's kind of like number 33, but it also first letter of his name. So I thought of have getting that tattooed with the dagger um to and i got it done on my on my birthday on the on march 3rd that's a great way to remember were you close to him i assume you're uh, yeah we grew up together did a bunch of uh crazy stuff together <laughs> first experience in many things together mm-hmm. and uh, got in trouble together <laughs> so uh but yeah he was uh i i he was the the one I I was probably the closest in my the closest to in my family, and we got together quite quite a bit until after high school when I had my boy. He was playing baseball, so he went to uh, another city to play baseball and moved there. So we didn't see each other for quite a few years, and then when he came back because he was sick and had needed treatment. He also got separated from his uh, former girlfriend, so he was more around. I got to see him a little bit and went to the hospital and things like that. But uh, yeah, it's nice to have a memory of him and a and a what's the word a tribute on you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was a. It, it's it's often something you say about someone that you know was sick all his life. Is I I never heard him complain about anything um getting all these treatments and surgeries and stuff and his voice was like uh, he used to talk like that because it was something growing on his vocal cord so it was blocking the sound of his voice Mm -hmm. so he couldn't talk clearly um but he's always played uh basket um i mean uh baseball and uh always been active and uh even at the end he was like sick as you can be and uh, still going on the field playing ba- uh, baseball and literally fainted on the on the bench because um, he was exhausted and didn't have the energy, but still wanted to play because he had a passion for it. So yeah, they used to call him Superman, and that was his nickname for for a while. And uh, he was uh, how do you say that? Intronized into like. A, sort of like the baseball hall of fame. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And got a, a, he was nominated for the baseball hall of fame where in the, in the Quebec for baseball Quebec, cause he, he was involved in that and he was a good, a good player and was an example for a lot of people. So well, well, that's, that's mad. Yeah. It's mad that he, he still had the energy to do that even towards the end and being so ill. That's crazy. Oh yeah, yeah, and even I, the the day before he died, like he he was on um, strong medication and because uh, of the pain and everything, and he lost a lot of weight. Even though he was ten, like a, a tall ten, he was six feet tall, maybe a hundred and seventy pounds, um, so very tall and and slim, um, but he he lost quite a bit of weight and then the day before he passed like i showed up in his hospital room and he got up and wanted to 
he was trying to put on his slippers and wanted to get out with me. I was like, no, we can't go anywhere, buddy. Like he, he still had it in him to, to, it was in, is in like an instinct to, you know, wanting to go out with me and, and go places. I was like, no, you have to stay here. Yeah. And uh, he ended up dying the next day, but like till the end, like he wasn't even complaining. He's like, Hey, let's, let's go outside. Let's, let's go down. Like, no, you can't, but he, you know, strong medication as well. Like you start losing it a little bit mm. and don't realize a lot of things, but it was just in him not to complain and just want to keep going. Right. God knows where he got that strength from. Yeah. Yeah. You wonder sometimes it's, I think the, the more, again, it's a, just an example of when I was saying you, you learn from, from, um, from hard experience and things that happen in your life because you you i find that you learn from that and uh in a way that you can appreciate the things that sometimes other people take for granted mm. but because you know the download of of certain situations then you can actually um understand that when it doesn't go well it's only temporary but when it when things are positive and things are going well in your life, then you don't have, don't take it for granted and be mindful of how you're, how well you're feeling and how fortunate you are to be up there. Yeah. Because yeah. The, the next time you drop, you, you need to remember how it feels to be up there and you need to know how to get back there and know that how shitty you might feel is just temporary because yeah. I've been in bad places before and I've, you know, I, sometimes you feel like you're not, you don't have the right to feel that way, but it's, it's normal. Like we all felt sh shitty at some point, but you have to know that you're, you're not alone going through these things and it, it will be fine one day. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's important to remember that. It's hard. Perhaps when you go through shit that you don't think that way. And I, I, I think you, you touched based on mental health before, uh, or I don't know if it was during my live or that you made a comment. Yeah, well, just I've had my fair share of problems. Uh, and at different level, we all deal with issues at some point. But what what I've realized and is going through what I went through for years is, or decades is sometimes you feel like you're alone. But even though you're not alone going through these things, uh, it's different for everybody. I mean, yeah. you can go through something and deal with it a certain way. And I, could, I can go through the same thing and deal with it totally differently. Mm -hmm. And another situation where we would go through something and it would be the total opposite where you deal with it fine and I, I would lose it, right? So mm -hmm. it's not because you've dealt with something a certain way that everybody else will mm -hmm. so it's, it's understanding yourself but also understanding people around you you never know what people are going through yeah and don't like, never judge or assume anything mm -hmm. and if someone reacts a certain way then don't um assume that that person is is the way um they're showing up that day because you don't know what happened and what's going through their mind and it, it doesn't define who they are because they reacted that way once, right? So you remind me, you're reminding me of a speech by, is it Mark Foster Wallace or David Foster Wallace? And the, the speech, let me find this because it'll annoy me. Uh, I, don't know who speech, that is. I will, you will really enjoy listening to this. Um, okay, so long and short of it. <clears throat> This, so it's a speech called This Is Water by a guy called David Foster Wallace. Um, I will give you a rough idea of what it was. Long and short of it is he was, uh, um, I think he was bipolar, but certainly had a, a very long history of depression, uh, serious, clinical all the time. And he was giving this speech in particular to uh, a group of students at, let me see, let's see. Okay, let's graduate. So it was a graduating class of 2005 in a university, 
Let me see. Class at Kenyon College. So anyway, he's talking to these students and he's trying to teach them about how to think or not how to think, but how to choose how you think. Yeah. But the speech is called This Is Water. If you Google This Is Water speech and just yeah, listen to that, it's about 30 minutes audio. The guy killed himself shortly after, but um, he was, and he, he, I mean, his life was tumultuous, would be uh, the very least of the words. If you read his Wikipedia, he was quite dodgy as well. I think he actually stalked a young girl for a number of years and had restraining orders against him, but I don't think it was ever violent or anything. He was just, you know, a bit insane, a bit eccentric, but that speech is fantastic about telling you not how to think, but how you have it in within you to choose how your perspective is and, and, and you, you are choosing to think negatively or, or you or you can choose to, to think positively. That'll have a, a vast, you know, uh, uh, impact on how, how you feel. You know? I think a lot, a lot with, um, mental health also is, well, in my case, I can, I even, by saying that I'm like no I shouldn't say that because again I can't I can't summarize it for other people is only I can only tell about what my experience is and how I I dealt with with that but um I I can certainly speak the way I speak today because of at one point there was a turning point in my life where I actually um realized or was diagnosed with something that now made sense to me and understand uh, I, it made me um to understand about myself and and then i i was able to to move forward understanding myself better mm -hmm. because before that i didn't know what was wrong so i i i was coping with a bunch of different things without knowing what and I thought that was the way to, to live. That was normal, mm -hmm. right? I had a lot of, to, to summarize a little bit in a few minutes, is I had a lot of uh, uh, major anxiety, generalized anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the anxiety would come up in ways that, like I would, I would puke every day. Like on my way to school, I would puke. It was so natural for me to puke it was like taking a sip of water like something that that's that you need to do to to live right you, you yeah. drink water well for me puking was the same thing as as drinking water like bile coming out of my liver because i was so anxious was a, a, a natural reaction to being anxious that i i just happened to learn a, I guess not learn to live with, but it was for me. It was like that's that's how it is. You get nervous, you puke, you don't feel good. You get, you know, you you feel like you're gonna pass out, and you get sweaty and shaky, and then you you puke, and then you cope with that, and then things get better, and then you know it, it goes through waves like that, where it gets to a point where you puke every day, multiple times a day, and you. You don't make a, you know, there, there's no red flag in your head that makes you think like, hey, buddy, that's not normal because you think um, sometimes either I was thinking I was getting crazy, I was going crazy, I was scared of going crazy because I thought my, my mind was racing too much all the time that I, I was scared that one day I was just going to lose it mentally and uh, didn't know that. I didn't know any different. I thought I was just, that was just my life. I was just generally anxious and had to go through phases of depression. And that's just how I knew. And then what I knew um, until, you know, m different things happened in my life at various times. And then at, at one point I got into like not going out. I couldn't go to the restaurant because the last time I went to the restaurant, I ch choked on my food. And then I don't go to the movie theater because the last time I almost passed out and then I don't go. So you, you sort of reduce your circle and your activities to being alone, not having any friends, not having any social activities, not going anywhere. 
and you deal with that anxiety and depression and then even go to work is is the toughest thing ever and then um things happen when you're at work and you get, have to go to the washroom and then not feel good and so you go on that you know going down 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 till you hit rock bottom and you just want to end it mm -hmm. and uh, there was a psychologist that was following me for for a while that I saw when I was a teenager that I called back when I was in my 30s and uh, he started following me for about a year and a half and then that day I got into it his off I got to his office sat down and he asked me just as usual you know started talking and he I looked at him I sat down I looked at him wasn't saying anything he looked at me he was like it's not going well eh and so knowing me for a while um that day was the last day i was going to see him and he sort of felt it knowing me for a while and now following me for about a year and a half so he walked down to the clinic where he knew a doctor and got me a, a note to be off work starting me on meds which i was refusing to take for over for years and that was the turning point in my life where i realized like okay there's another way to live and that's not right for you and it's not you can't keep going that way and that was like i said either i was going to end it or that guy did the right thing to notice it and had a good conversation and had me start the meds which was a turning point in my life and then i would say within a year i was like wow i I'm living a life that I didn't even know existed to start with. Was starting doing things that I never did before and felt a way that I never before. And that weight off my chest and my shoulders got me to do things like starting a channel, doing things that I like and starting living for a bit. Yeah. It's never far away. You know, mental health is always very close. And sometimes I go to, but I'm, I'm more aware of the signs and yeah. now I can, I can, like I said, knowing myself and I, I can't help, I can, you know, by this, this is my way of, of sharing that, you know, it can happen to anyone because before I didn't have any reference of like, oh, this person's going through that. Like it's, it's, I'm fine. Like, you know, there's, there's a way to, 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 to work around that. And, and there's, there's a brighter side of it. Um, so I can't help fixing people, but I can actually speak from my experience and say, like, if you're going through things like that, then it's, you're not alone. That's, that's all I can say. Like, I can't help anyone to make them feel better other than saying you're not alone. Just yeah. know you're not alone, but there's something you can do for yourself, but you have to do it. Yeah. And absolutely. so me, me, it was to, to take conscious of that and, and know what works for me. And now I have those anchors and those, those warning signs that I have and I know myself and I listen to my body more than ever. And so before it happens, I know what to do and how, how to get back to how to ground myself. Yeah. So yeah, yeah to summarize it, that's, that's how I've, 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 I, I've make it to where I'm at right now in my life is there, there has to be a turning point. Yeah. Well, the long and short of mine, um, I'd always suffered from generalized anxiety as well. Not quite to the extreme where I was being sick or having sweaty panic attacks or anything, but this always didn't feel quite right. And then from a young age, like the first time I would have got drunk and stuff, I noticed that it just went away. It was, yeah. that solved it. So that was my problem was uh, then uh, it didn't take long for me to, uh, start drinking regularly uh, started working in a bar and back in the day when it was okay maybe you wouldn't get away with it now but I was drunk all the time and the managers knew but because I wasn't so drunk that I was falling all over the place you know I was just happy and you know the customers thought I was really friendly and so it doesn't matter it's fine so you get away with it and then that led to be you know being yeah, addicted to alcohol and being addicted to other drugs and uh, just living like that for many years, like 10 years or so. And then recently, say seven, eight years ago, 
I couldn't stop drinking, so I was trying to stop, and I just couldn't. Like three or four days into withdrawal, I would just drink. So I started uh, using opiates like codeine, which really helped to lift your mood when you're going through alcohol withdrawal. So I managed to shift from taking alcohol every day to taking codeine and became addicted to that. So I'm actually on a you know replacement program at the minute still. Um, so I have to pee in a cup every you know month or so just to so that I can you know they'll not help me unless I'm helping myself that kind of thing. Yeah, but, exactly. but yeah, thankfully I'm I'm in a good position. I've a lot of support from family and, and my wife. Thank Christ, you know she would have been well within her rights to leave me yeah. a good few times in in the past seven years, but eight years. But she stuck with me and. Like fuck no, and like I've only been properly, yeah, clean properly for less than two years. But it's getting easier every day, isn't it? Um, yeah. But yeah, like you say, you know, when you feel like things are getting bad, or like I, I know I would never talk. I'm not much of a talker. Come from a long line of people who don't talk. Like my dad, dad's father, he says didn't speak much, and you know, it's, yeah. Just we're emotionally, I don't know if you're allowed to use that word, uh, emotionally, yeah, just not, not there, not, uh, it's, it's just too strange to talk to anyone about your emotions, but now I know that it really does actually help and whenever I feel yeah, like. I, I, I used to not talk about that and mm. even as, as far as I can remember, I was more seen like the, the guy that's, um, snob or not easy to approach because i would always have my back in the days we had a walkman for music right mm -hmm. and i was always plugged in at school high school always had my my headphones and listening to music mm -hmm. and in my bubble um and uh, i think there's something from what you said is is that's common for people using i i for over 10 years i'm smoking weed like probably smoke more than my own weight in, in, in marijuana um, started with just one, you know, after work and then quickly became like six, seven joints a day, like at least two grams a day. Like it, it was nonsense, like waking up with a joint and multiple during the day and I needed one to go to bed. And when I stopped cold, cold Turkey, I shaked for days and I don't think it's, it's necessarily the, whatever you're using that you're addicted to, but it's the, whatever you're self medicated with that you're, you're craving. Cause you need that, that, um, that anchor yeah. and you rely on that for many situations. So for me, it was self medicating my anxiety with, with that cause it would calm me down. Mm -hmm. But so there's always that, I think that side of us that needs to, cope with certain problems, certain issues, mental issues. So we find different ways, but it was also in my case, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder where right. I, I go full in like full throttle into something like that. Um, like I said, when I started smoking weed, it couldn't be just a couple puffs. It had to be like six, seven joints a day. Oh, I had to go full throttle. Right. So, um so when i when i live my emotions if i'm depressed i'm i'm fucking depressed like you know i, I and if i have a, a, a bad thoughts or the hamster going in you know spinning that wheel then it, it goes full full throttle into like that loophole and uh that rabbit hole starting thinking and then thinking and overthinking yeah um so so I think it's a combination of both the the mental illness, the, the mental illness and whatever emotions that you're trying to suppress and the compulsive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. So I think that's where the meds really help for me is to, to help with the anxiety, the depression and OCD. So it's it's doing all three, the meds that I've been taking for eight years now. So it, it really balanced these things out where I can live normal now. Like I go through emotions without being 
majorly anxiety, majorly anxious or majorly depressed, but I still go through ups and downs. It's yeah. just that the downs are not as, as, uh, impacting as, as they used to, because I, I couldn't live a life not being medicated or I, I can try to get off the meds at some point, but, um, I don't think it's something that I could have done on my own, you know, to, to get back on track. And I, I still, think that there's something physically in, in, in my case, in many people that, um, as much as you're trying to do on your own, you, you, there's a, a, an unbalance in your, your chemistry that needs to be, you know, rectified or helped with medications because it's just, yeah. And it's not, it's not, not, it's not a, yeah, there's, just, there's too much stigma around that as well. So a like, lot. Yeah. And my wife can tell you like, She's been good to stay with me as well, going through all these things. And then now she she's going through some health issues, uh, mental health issues. But, um, you know, when at some point, when it, even a, a stigma you're talking about was even a doctor that I, I needed a renewal of my prescription and not having a family doctor, I had to go to just a regular clinic and the doctor just looked down on me saying my meds were just smarties and that was basically just a you know an addict an addict looking for his fix and that was my wife was like when i came back and it, it gave me anxiety and going through a, a depressed mode for like a week or two just because of that medication that medical appointment right yeah and my wife was like that that person is so stupid like he's just a general doctor physician that doesn't know anything about mental health yeah. and yeah. I've been with you for 15 years and I could sit down with that crappy doctor and tell him more about mental health than he probably knows. Yeah. And uh, there's no way you can get out of meds. And if you do, then I'll be the one getting your meds because there's no way you're going back to how you were before. Yeah. And she, you know, she knows she's with me and like Steph, you know, they, they know they see us. And I think it's just as, as hard for people around us that it is for us. Mm -hmm. Maybe not as much, but it is, it's pretty hard to be around someone that struggles with mental health. Yeah, That's, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, yeah, just to make a, a poignancy on that note then, if there's anyone watching this who struggles with mental health issues and thinks it's a bad idea to speak to someone about it, just coming from two bas basket cases here, who, I mean, I'm sure from what you've said, I can ascertain that you felt like me in the past in that there is no fixing this there is no. so people get out there speak to your doctor there is a way out if you're feeling bad it's normal just ask for help yeah. just get help because you can you can come around and lead a normal life i wouldn't have thought that i could have lived normally like this time 10 years ago i thought right this is it like i'm just gonna be i'll be dead by 40 that's it you know yeah Oh, same, same for me. It was just no way I was getting, make it through, you know, living what I was, the way I was living. And then you start understanding more and, and you can't fix it. And it's never something you're going to be, you know, you can't do a, a 180 degree turn and be a total different person. It's always going to be within you and it's always going to some, be something that's going to be there but you need to you need to know how to work on yourself and work with that yeah um, it's not something you can fix but you can definitely it can definitely be better than it is right yep. it's always so one step at a time and like like i said i i've I think right now, even when it goes back to what I said at the beginning of the, 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 this, this meeting is even during COVID, I still find a way to see the bright thing, the bright side of things, because I, I'm allowed, I'm, I'm allowed and I'm, I'm allowing myself to, to see the positive side and to get something out of it, either learn or, um, you know, adjust and adapt. And that's something I've been able to do in it. Like, you know, I'm enjoying my pipes. I'm enjoying my family. That nothing bad is happening, you yeah. know, in yeah. my, in my little circle, things might be bad outside, 
but at least I have some anchors, some, some things to rely on to make myself and my life better. Yeah. And when you have these good foundations, then if little things fall apart elsewhere, then you can always go back to those anchors and ground yourself. And you need, you need that. So that's what you need to work on those ground, like how to ground yourself, what's important for you, know yourself, and then you can help yourself. Yeah. If you don't know yourself and not don't know what the issue is, then how can you work on those issues? Right? Yeah, absolutely. And be ready to forgive yourself for whatever you've done. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I think we've gone in long enough now over two hours I think definitely Gosh, I can't imagine who's going to watch that for two hours they will I think they will we I hope, hope they make it to the, the end I think it was a great like I really appreciate you open up and, and that last bit of conversation that we had I think I didn't know it was going to be we were going to touch base but that's what I like about being spontaneous and yeah. not mine to be you know to, to talk about these things is yeah whenever there's you know it happens in the conversation just go with the flow and be spontaneous and i really appreciate the chat we had and it's it was really nice to, to cover what we talked yeah. about today thank you i think i'll leave a note in the bucket just saying yeah just for any benefit as well mental health issues out there. there's a lot of people it's more than one in four now these days and especially during these trying times it's, it could be helpful i appreciate you opening up to me as well mate and uh, it's been a fantastically useful conversation for me personally yeah thanks to you as well no i'll end the recording here i'll not close the, the zoom so thanks for watching folks right to the bitter end and uh we'll see you soon thanks to ben unicorn piper Cheers. We'll be both seeing you later. Cheers.